Hyperdrive, Warp Drive, Holtzman Drive. We have a lot of names for faster than light speed or FTL space travel in popular science fiction. To boldly go where no man has gone before. But sadly, in reality, traveling to our nearest neighboring star system is a distant dream and would need us nearly 6,000 years to get there. So how come we would ever be able to achieve such a technology that can make us zoom through the entire galaxy in one lifetime or less? Maybe never, because we are not supposed to. But why? Welcome to Factnominal, and let's find out how FTL travel can create time travel and thus paradoxes. Space is big. Well, to be honest, that is quite an understatement. It's ginormous. So, when an author decides to write about a futuristic swashbuckling adventure in space, they are bound to come up with some sort of faster than light communication and travel. Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. If they don't do so, planet hopping would become downright impossible as their protagonists would be long dead before they can answer the call of distress on the nearest star system. However, faster than light communication of travel breaks something very fundamental about physics. Something that is often ignored by sci-fi and difficult for non-physicists to understand. If you allow faster than light travel and communication, then you break causality. And when causality breaks, you are allowing time travel. In a nutshell, the universe is asking us to choose two of these three. Relativity, causality, and or FTL. Universe has made its choice already for us by picking relativity and causality. This is why it is on us to find a way to travel faster than light. But will we ever succeed? Dr. Stephen Hawking believed that we won't. But before we talk about why Dr. Hawking was such a Debbie Downer, let's try to understand the hand the universe has dealt us. The universe is largely made up of space and time, or space-time which according to Albert Einstein is a four-dimensional model. If we try to draw these four dimensions in a diagram, well, well we can't, it's a two-dimensional screen. We can't even draw three dimensions on it, but that shouldn't stop us from understanding space-time. So let's just suppress all space dimensions and draw the entirety of space as a line. So if we are stationary at a point in the space line, time will tick forward or orthogonal to the space directions around us. For others, time will also move similarly no matter where they are on the space line because of relativity. Now, the special thing about relativity is that everyone measures the speed of light to be the same. It can be shown in a space-time diagram by saying that every space-time diagram has light traveling at 45 degrees relative to the time axis. Light travels on lines that are called null. For example, on this diagram. Let's say that two null lines of light are emitted from an event that happened now, and let's denote now as t equals zero, to not get confused for the rest of the video. Even though space is a line in this diagram, it still contains all of the space dimensions, and these rays of light are really emanating out in a sphere around us. Because light travels at 45 degrees, anything traveling slower than light from this t equals zero event is closer to the time axis than the light rays and anything faster than light is further away from the time axis. I know diagrams are hard to follow, but let's keep this in mind while we move to an example of FTL actually happening. Let's say we on Earth have built an FTL communication device that lets us talk to the inhabitants of the planet Proxima Centauri b 4.25 light years away. As you remember, where we are on the space line and where Proxima Centauri residents would be is relative. So, let's make another point for them different from ours. This is because Proxima Centauri is moving at essentially the same velocity as Earth. The differences are small compared to the speed of light. Thus, there are no big relativistic events between our counting of time and the Proximal Centaurians. Now, let's imagine that some event occurs away from Earth oriented in such a way that the light from the event hits us before it reaches Proxima Centauri. The space-time diagram for that would look like this. First, we see the light, then the light reaches Proxima Centauri. Notice that the light rays from the event are traveling at 45 degrees to the Earth's time axis. After all, it is light and light travels at 45 degrees on space-time diagrams. So now, let's add in FTL communication. We see the event, we get on the FTL phone, and we tell the Proximal Centaurians. 
They get the phone call immediately and now have years to prepare for the arrival of the light from whatever the event is. We are already flirting with the boundaries of science fiction, so let's say it's a giant laser beam traveling at the speed of light obliterating everything in its path. And by coincidence, it's on course to strike Proxima Centaurian's home planet. Now, the diagram with FTL communication added to the equation would look something like this. Do you see the problem? No? Well, we all agree that the event happened first. Then Earth calls Proxima Centauri. Then the light reaches Proxima Centauri. Everything looks sugar and sweet there, even though the Proximal Centaurians hear about the event early, no causality has been violated. After all, we all agree on what happened first, don't we? No effect precedes its cause. But this diagram only depicts the causality and FTL. Remember, earlier in this video, we mentioned how the laws of the universe force us to choose two of three principles, relativity, causality, and FTL. And clearly, according to this diagram, we chose causality and FTL. But the universe has already made the choice to stick with causality and relativity. So something's amiss. We need to fix this. The timeline in the diagram only works when everyone is moving in the same frame of reference, like us and Proxima Centauri. So, to see the problem, let's add a new observer, moving at high speeds relative to Earth and Proxima Centauri. Say, a spaceship, moving at a speed faster than light as well. Here's where the relativistic effects start coming into play. Relativity tells us that everyone moving with constant velocity is totally justified in saying they are stationary. So, for a moment, if we ignore the whole Earth revolving around the Sun and the Sun moving with the rest of the galaxy, we can say the Earth is stationary and, similarly, Proxima Centauri is stationary. But neither we nor Proxima Centauri is moving at the speed of light. The aforementioned spaceship is. However, for them, they are at rest too. If they drew their own space diagram with their own axis, their time axis will be aligned with the ship's trajectory. In addition, they have a space axis just like we do. Relativity mixes up space and time so their space axis would be slanted for us. Just like their time axis is skewed, it turns out that the space axis is flipped across the 45 degree null line. This weird mixture of space and time of observers we perceive as moving is a necessary part of relativity. So, what happens now? Let's ask when the spaceship sees the various events in this diagram. To do that, we need to know the lines of constant time for the ship. That's not too hard. Lines of constant time for us are lines in the space-time diagram parallel to the space axis. So, it is for the spaceship. Their lines of constant time look like this. Now, let's recall the events we discussed earlier. We see the space laser beam pass by us on its course to hit Proxima Centauri. We call Proxima Centauri on the FTL phone. The Proximal Centaurians do whatever they do in response to that call, and then they see the light of the event. But on the ship, things will be different. According to the diagram, they would see the phone call received on Proxima Centauri. Then they would witness the phone call placed from Earth. Effect precedes cause, thus causality is broken. Now, before you argue that light takes a finite amount of time to travel and a spaceship can see the events happening immediately, well, you are forgetting that the light from the phone call reception arrives well before the light from the placing of the phone call. The causality would be violated nonetheless. Basically, that spaceship, by traveling faster than light, is traveling in time and therefore has the power to cause time paradoxes. Under relativity, whether certain events occur simultaneously is no longer an absolute thing, but a relative one. In this fascinating animation, if B is stationary, then events A, B, and C all happen simultaneously. However, if B is moving towards C, B's plane of simultaneity slopes upward, leaving C in its past. On the other hand, if B is moving toward A, C is now its future. This is why the spaceship in our little hypothesis witnesses the event of Proxima Centaurians receiving the warning call before the Earth makes the call. Now, they have information that can be used to alter the course of events. They can intercept the call when Earth makes it or interrupt Earth from making the call in the first place. This will not only break time but may break the entire universe. This is why the universe has put a safety measure, a speed limit in the fundamental of physics that we can breach. Even if future societies have strict taboos against interfering with the past, 
The idea that such taboos would hold for all societies until the end of time seems unsustainable. Since FTL is also time travel, the same observation would seem to rule out most forms of it. As we know every law is broken by someone, it doesn't seem realistic that laws of time and causality are an exception to this, if means to break them are possible at any given time in the future. Stargates or wormholes where a destination version has to be built might be the only ones that avoid this issue. But wormholes would have their own problem. The wormholes in fiction always connect distant points together but wormholes are connections between two points in space-time. There's no particular reason it would be limited to some arbitrary version of now. Indeed, a natural wormhole like the one in Star Trek Deep Space Nine would be more likely to open to some distant point in the future, long after the heat death of the universe, than somewhere along the Badgerin plane of simultaneity. However, to build a wormhole, we would require an incredible amount of mass and energy, and then too, they might not be stable. It's a sad reality, but it might be true that we are bound to our star system. Well, at least for a long, long future. Maybe we should start taking good care of our planet, shouldn't we? Tell us in the comments how you think interstellar travel can be achieved without breaking time. And as always, thanks for watching Factnominal.